Uh, good afternoon. My name's uh, Bob Carroll. I'm at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and I wanted to talk to this group about uh, catheter infections uh, as it um, uh, as it relates to parental nutrition. We can go over some of the epidemiology, which is important, but I think the um, some of the newer science and sort of understanding uh, bacterial uh, um, biofilms and how uh, how these infections uh, 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 are driven are, are going to be um, interesting for the future treatment. So the uh, the CDC uh, um, uh, requirements for a catheter-related catheter bloodstream infections, that's how these are monitored in the hospital. The same applies into the uh, parenteral nutrition sort of home, home, home world. But uh, the CDC says you need systemic infection, evidence of an infection with uh, catheter and peripheral blood cultures positive uh, with the same organism. Um, in one European study, uh, less than 50% of cases reported of uh, catheter-related infections failed to meet this criteria. So um, defining the beast is kind of uh, important. So what do we know about the epidemiology of these infections? Uh, if, uh, you've probably all or you may or may not have heard the term, but catheter infection rates are measured sort of as uh, uh, bloodstream infections per thousand catheter days. So um, a, if you had one uh, infected catheter in a thousand days, that's, a, that's an infection rate of one. Um, some, some, uh, some rates are actually quite high. They uh, have ranged from uh, as high as 11.1 uh, .1 per thousand uh, in some studies at uh, Emory, but uh, in most modern centers now, we strive for uh, infection rates of less than uh, one, in, uh, one infection per thousand catheter days, often in some of the pediatric centers, uh, quite a bit less than that. Uh, if you look at other infection rates for comparisons, I think it's uh, sort of enlightening. A hemodialysis catheter um, typically has a, uh, uh, a patient getting dialysis has uh, the rates reported from dialysis centers are between 2.2 to 5.5 uh, uh, bloodstream infections per thousand catheter days. Uh, there's about 80,000 uh, 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 of central line related infections annually in the ICU, 250,000 overall in the United States. There's 150 million IV devices uh, used annually in the US. Uh, 5 million central venous catheters. So it's a fairly target rich environment for bacteria. The Krankenhaus infection surveillance system, which uh, KISS comes from Germany, Krankenhaus I think is the German word for hospital, uh, estimated that uh, the cost of these are about 30,000 euros per infection. In the United States that translates to somewhere between 33 and $75,000 uh, in the US. Uh, the length of stay uh, for a catheter infection is about seven days, I would say, by the time you change the catheter and uh, um, mark the response. And there's often a period of uh, home an antibiotics that occurs after this. So they're fairly expensive infections. They're also life-threatening infections. There's a lot of reasons to understand and prevent uh, their occurrence. Um, ICUs tend to have uh, higher rates of these infections than uh, the floor. In the trauma ICUs, these can uh, be as high as uh, 18 bloodstream infections per thousand catheter days. Burn units is probably the highest rates, report the highest rates of, uh, of central line uh, catheter infections in the country. Um, the catheter-related bloodstream infections is the third leading cause of hospital infections overall. It's be it comes behind the number one is um, uh, catheter-associated uh, Foley catheter urinary tract infections and then surgical uh, site infections. If you look in the Midwest, uh, the numbers uh, uh, come in somewhere between rates for C. difficile infection and methicillin-resistant staph aureus in hospitals. So they're a fairly significant and frequent um, hospital infection. Um, well, what's what has been done is the Hawthorne is the uh, Hawthorne at one time was in Chicago was the largest uh, uh, was the very large Western Electric Company uh, plant. Uh, 
the uh, dome of this uh, is still seen from Ogden Avenue as you can come into the city, but uh, the Hawthorne effect was if you started to measure something, the incidence of it went down. Um, and we can say that that's been seen uh, in 2003, um, um, around that time that uh, uh, Social Security and the, uh, the various uh, hospitals began to look at their rates of catheter infections and try to control them. And that has brought the numbers down uh, significantly in the last tw almost 20 years now. Um, our hospital in the, in the early aughts had a rate of between nine and 10 uh, uh, catheter infections per thousand days. Uh, it's right around one now uh, and would be lower. So what do we know about the factors uh, with catheter infections? The central venous catheter is much more likely to be infected than the peripheral uh, venous catheter. A PIC line uh, really counts as a central venous catheter. It's just peripherally inserted central catheter. Uh, PIC lines have increased uh, infection rates over the tunneled central line and uh, tunneled central line catheters. And the subclavians uh, seem to be better than the internal jugular veins, which do better than the femoral veins. Uh, uh, there's a, a little bit of, uh, uh, there are, this is also true for catheter related thrombosis. There's a little bit higher rate of pneumothorax with the subclavian tunnel subclavian line insertion. But these days with IR insertion under ultrasound guidance, those rates are still very low. The single lumens do less uh, better than the triple lumens. Uh, implantable ports uh, do better than uh, tunneled ports um, uh, versus non-tunneled uh, catheters. Um, in our hospital, uh, in our TPN group, we also notice patients who require Extra, I, besides their parenteral nutrition who require other antibiotics or other, other infusions um, seem to have higher rates of, uh, of line infections as well. What about the host factors in infections? Uh, we do more, uh, this is true in our data too here at U of I, but more infections occur in males. It's, uh, it's probably almost, it's easily two to one, maybe closer to three to one if you look in some series. Most within the first six months of catheter insertion. Um, th there's no surprise really to me with this data. If you looked at uh, my wife and mine inside of the bedroom, as far as uh, orderliness, um, I think you could say probably why uh, the males uh, run higher infection rates. Um, comorbidities also have a, a, a role to play here. Diabetes, malignancy, a history of an organ transplant, granulocytopenia, uh, uh, these other responses also increase the rate of catheter-related infections. Um, parents in studies are better or equal to home nurses, uh, which is better than self-care. But I think uh, education is the key to the prevention of catheter infections, education and discipline. Um, sometimes that's actually the patient disciplining the, the home health nurse that comes because sometimes uh, uh, they aren't so good either, I've been told by some of my uh, uh, PN patients. Um, no proven link to hyperglycemia in the ICU. There was an increased uh, risk in one study with the total calories infused. Uh, this is associated uh, uh, also um, with increased fungal infections in the ICU. And there are some possible links to lipid infusion, although the recent data um, published suggests there's isn't much difference. The epidemic, out, epidemic outbreaks are rare, always end up reportable. This is uh, uh, contamination uh, usually at the manufacturing site where the parental nutrition is uh, uh, composed and there'll be sort of multi-site outbreaks. These are very sporadic and um, uh, there have been outbreaks of uh, serratia marcescens in home TPN Enterobacter cloicae and candida albicans and some NICUs, but uh, NICUs. But uh, um, the more common, the more common infection is the catheter-related infection. And uh, like all the central venous catheter infections in parenteral nutrition, uh, the majority of these are gram-positive infections, uh, followed by gram-negative infections in blue, and then the fungi, sort of in the orange-brown color. Um, uh, Polymicrobial infections uh, sometimes suggest a central source. 
Uh, in gram positive infections, Staph epi is the most prevalent. It's a, um, commonly isolated on the skin. It's the most common uh, infectious isolated in home parental nutrition patients. Pr probably accounts for uh, about 60% of the infections. ICU data suggests uh, that it's a more indolent. Uh, often the line can be saved with antibiotic therapy. Um, uh, Methicillin-sensitive methicillin staph aureus, second most common. This may be reduced by surveillance of uh, um, uh, uh, and swabbing of uh, exit sites. But uh, uh, methicillin-resistant staph aureus is the least common. Uh, it's a more difficult infection to treat. We see uh, more of it in our prison um, populations, uh, less responsive to catheter salvage strategies. Um, it's a more aggressive infection. Gram-negative is the most frequent isolate on uh, parental nutrition is still Klebsiella pneumonia, followed by Enterobacter fecalis and uh, 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 E. coli. 60% of these infections are associated, gram-negative infections are more associated with fevers, clinical sepsis, and the SERS response. Um, the E. coli EBSL, um, uh, the extended, uh, expended uh, spectrum make, making them uh, drug resistant and uh, 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 vancomycin resistant enterococcus are, are also on the rise in catheter. Canada albicans is still the most common, but Candida paracellosis is increasingly isolated from parental nutrition patients and now is seen maybe as an infection, sort of uh, not really unique to this group, but. Um, maybe overexpressed in the parenteral nutrition group. Uh, and parenteral nutrition use is incorporated into a candidate score in the ICU and deciding to treat for candidate colonization of the urine and skin uh, may pr uh, predict increased risk. Uh, evidence of specific infection complications from line infections. Um, the most common is sort of fever and sepsis, but uh, you can see uh, end organ uh, damage and end ophthalmitis has been described in ICU patients uh, with central line infections. The overall clinical significance of these findings is unquestionable, maybe outside of the fungal disease. Endocarditis has rarely been reported uh, in recent years. Uh, I've seen cases, I suspect uh, valve infections still occur from central line catheters. Um, Vertebral osteomyelitis was a, um, a complication described uh, originally in a Montreal study, and we have seen it here. It's basically a bloodborne infection that um, causes a uh, disc infection. Um, we had one patient, she presented with fevers, chills, and then a very remarkably elevated SED rate and CRP with back pain, localized back pain. Um, unfortunately, this requires um, antibiotics and sometimes surgical debridement to treat, uh, she required a two-level disectomy. So these infections can have serious sequelae. Um, they can be fatal. Uh, uh, what can we do to prevent them, I think, is uh, uh, what we'll talk about next. I, I'll, I'll say a little bit, malignancy, because probably it lowers your infection rates, does uh, increase your uh, risk of, uh, of sepsis. There's a higher infection rate in, uh, uh, in, uh, in cancer patients that are on uh, TPN. Parental nutrition still has a role in, in, uh, in malignancy. Um, uh, they have, I think, more complications overall. But it really, I think, my experience is if the tumor is responsive to chemotherapy, then the, the parental nutrition doesn't take away or, or add all that much. So I, we defer to our oncologists sort of in the, um, uh, the use and uh, role of parental nutrition and malignancy. So I want to, the, um, the short-term location of catheter infections, more sort of related to the peripheral IV is at the, uh, is at the skin insertion site and long-term uh, catheter infection rates, the hub is the more, the contaminated catheter hub is the more uh, uh, implicated uh, organ organisms. Many of you know from the central catheter exchange kits, there's a, uh, a film that's applied over the hub at the center, and we do, we have replaceable 
uh, even antibiotic impregnated caps that can, uh, that, uh, can be placed on the hub. Uh, and um, antibiotic impregnated catheters work short term. There's some interest in silver catheters. Uh, pediatrics, good evidence that hasn't been as uh, used as much, I don't think, in the, in the adult parenteral nutrition or uh, antibiotic and alcohol dwell have both been tried. The alcohol does increase your thrombosis risk a little bit. But um, for the last part of the talk, keeping track of time here, um, uh, I wanna talk about some advances are, and a little bit about uh, biofilm. I think some of my slides are hidden under the pictures there, but uh, I think that's gotta be Anton von Leeuwenhoek on the left and Bill Kosterton. He was a, uh, a microbiologist who did a lot of the early work and he's considered the father sort of of uh, the biofilm science. He supposedly got interested in them when he slipped on a rock, walking on a slippery rock in a stream in Colorado was interested in how the Pseudomonas uh, created the uh, film that lived on the rock in the flowing streams. But uh, uh, catheters post-insertion are coated with fibrin, uh, fibronectin, and collagen. This is a, a uh, EM from uh, the uh, film around a catheter uh, after it's been in a, in a dog, I think, for uh, seven days. Um, uh, there, the microbes themselves secrete scaffolding uh, these proteins are scaffolding adhesions and the microbes themselves uh, secrete proteins called uh, microbials uh, secreted uh, compounds uh, responding to adhesive matrix molecules, I think. Um, so the, the bacteria actually look for these proteins that are uh, sort of ended up coating your, the internal part of the catheter. Uh, these biofilms then provide refuge for opsonization by um, uh, antibodies and phagocytosis by white cells. And it creates a niche of cells that are called persisters uh, versus planktonic cells, which uh, sort of grow on the surface uh, uh, of the catheter. And they, these persister, these, uh, these microbial persisters are uh, sort of not immune, but they're difficult to detect by the immune system. They become kind of metabolically inactive and inert. They stop dividing. Uh, uh, and uh, they actually um, uh, uh, also, uh, this also leads to their uh, inability to respond to antibiotics because antibiotics work on metabolically active cells and cells that are dividing. Um, the, and uh, these uh, biofilms are polymicrobial. Uh, they, um, uh, up to 80% of infections uh, uh, of medical devices are associated with my, my uh, biofilm formation, uh, CVC catheters, but also implantable medical devices like pacemakers, um, gastric pacemakers. These all are prone to biofilm development. And um, um, the, uh, um, these auto inducers, there are compounds um, uh, uh, shown below here. Um, some of them, the bromo, Galiferin, um, been isolated from sponges, but there are compounds that prevent the bacteria from um, one, adhering to a biofilm and then growing or maturing within the biofilm. So there are, uh, there are, uh, there are control measures being used to, do, to find drugs uh, that prevent the attachment and formation of biofilms. Uh, the other targets um, um, are cytosine diguanosine uh, monophosphate uh, can regulate the formation of these biofilms. Uh, it's, it's synthesized by an enzyme called diguanolate cyclases. They're uh, degraded by these EAL phosphodiesterases, which are another uh, protein secreted by uh, bacteria uh, uh, that uh, are able to uh, um, uh, create this uh, uh, film formation where you sort of develop this sessile uh, lifestyle versus the mobile um, bacteria leaving the catheter and entering the bloodstream. Uh, um, these are uh, potential targets now in Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections in burn unit catheters. Um, quorum sensing, I think, is one of the more important concepts that I've read about. So a bacteria, um, will be able is able to secrete a uh, a molecule and basically 
it can tell the, it's, I said it's kind of the internet of biofilms. So it, the bacteria are able to tell how many, how by uh, lab, sensing the concentration of a compound in its immediate milieu, are able to tell how many other bacteria are there. So whether they're there in low density or high density, and this changes the behavior of the bacteria and the molecules that they excrete. Um, so uh, uh, once low density um, um, uh, uh, <coughs> pathogens recognize that they are high density pathogens, once that known that they've grown to a large size, so this infection rate around the catheter is high, uh, they detach and embolize and behave more aggressively and probably create or uh, uh, contribute to the sepsis syndrome. Uh, the autoinducers or the uh, uh, ability of these uh, bacteria uh, are species specific uh, and they have uh, gene structural patterns uh, in both gram negative bacteria and gram positive bacteria analysis to the lac operon. But the specifics aren't important, but basically the bacteria is secreting a substance into its extracellular milieu that's reacting with the receptor that's uh, sending a secondary signal back inside the, uh, to the DNA of the uh, bacteria. And, and then it's changing the genes that are expressed. So the, uh, the secretion of proteins that allows um, the quorum, to, the quorum meaning the, the size of the bacterial pool that's uh, sort of on the, on the infected device uh, allows us to change its behavior. I said before, the, uh, the gram-negative bacteria use these top compounds called acyl homoserine lactones, AHL. Staph aureus use another uh, uh, sort of sulfur lactone ring uh, called the AIP1, 2, and 3. But um, uh, so these compounds are secreted by the bacteria that are sitting in the biofilm on the catheter, and they're telling each other how many of them are there and whether or not they're going to uh, be able to uh, uh, whether they should be staying on the catheter or leaving. Uh, and it seems to be, it's the leaving, it's the disseminating of these bacteria into the bloodstream that creates the SIRS infections and it creates the secondary site infections. And I think is the essence of the problem. Canada also behaves in the same way. They increase, uh, they secrete molecules called Farnesol and Tyrosol. They're shown at the right. That changes the behavior of the of the growth phase of the of the of the candida bacteria itself, if it's uh, um, if it's in its hypha form, it's not a replicating. If it's in the budding form, shown sort of here at the right. Um, the budding uh, are the yeast that will transmit and infect the eye, the liver, create abscesses. Uh, so um, uh, the um, quorum sensing molecules. Uh, can help the yeast both form biofilms and, um, and also tell it when to change from sort of uh, a hyphal to uh, the budding phase of, uh, of growth. Staph aureus secretes proteins that secrete through a uh, RNA wrap trap uh, program, but this is a, uh, uh, the RNA3 polymerase is uh, induced by a, uh, uh, a gene sensing symptoms uh, unique to Staph aureus. Uh, the uh, um, uh, the rap trap receptor is on the surface, and it it sends signals back to uh, secrete RNA three, which um, uh, controls the uh, um, uh, uh, toxin production by uh, Staph aureus and uh, inhibits the ability to adhere to a bio to be disseminated. There's a uh, compound actually in witch hazel, which is uh, a tree blooming here at the uh, Chicago Botanic Garden, uh, Hamil, Hamil tannin, but uh, um, it's a uh, natural analog of, of an inhibitor protein that uh, prevents this rap trap signaling. Um, and they're actually working to develop as an antibiotic compound in catheter infections. I mean, when I went to the barber back in the 50s and 60s, they would actually put witch hazel on the back of your neck to prevent the razor burn from getting infection and preventing a staph infection. So uh, um, uh, there are roles um, uh, for, for under, I think there are, there's a role for understanding the signal, signaling process in these line infections. I was in the Navy for a short part of my career 
there was a concept in the military called a, an OODA loop, which was to observe, uh, orient, I think it's act and detect, can't see the right side of it, but uh, it, was, it was an application in military strategy that had applications to business. I think it maybe have, has a role in microbial infections because we've been trying to change antibiotics around and develop new antibiotics. Um, so our first effort is to been, move faster than the enemy. I think the bugs are developing microbial resistance faster than we can develop new antibiotics. I'm also a little bit skeptical about our in, ability to inhibit uh, biofilm formation. This is a fairly evolutionary conserved part of bacterial behavior. But I think the signaling aspects of bacteria telling each other how many of them are there and whether to behave in a sort of a mild manner, lay low, sort of low level um, growth on a catheter versus um, the high level where they're um, actively disengaging from the catheter and causing bloodstream infections. I think this is a real possibility. We can probably control infections uh, or control the rate of bacterial contamination on catheters. I don't, I don't think we're gonna ever, ever be able to eliminate it, but um, thank you for your attention. I'll, uh, it's a speculative talk, but I, th I think the, uh, the future is bright for the control of catheter-related infections. Thank you.